Well, hello there, and welcome to my amazingly amateur documentary on the topic of an epic historic legend, Isambard Kingdom Brunel. He was born on the 9th of April 1806, just over 200 years ago. To get here, we've had to skip most of the great historic periods, such as the Egyptians, the Middle Ages, and the Tudors, to find ourselves in the steadily industrialising Victorian Britain. Did I say steadily? Since the development of steam power by James Watt, every part of British life changed, from work to living standards, to technology. Some for the best, and others for the worst. Brunel was born into this developing and dangerous prison, and let's just say he was one of the best things in the Industrial Revolution. Isambard Kingdom Brunel was born in Portsmouth, in this house on Britain Street. His father, Marc Brunel, was a French refugee from the French Revolution and had already designed some amazing things such as the Thames Tunnel and a device that allowed the miners mining it to safely mine into the damp and deadly river bottom. It isn't surprising that his son was soon on the scene and it is also not surprising that his influence on Britain would be much greater. One of Brunel's first notable projects was the Thames Tunnel with his father, Mark. Brunel was assistant engineer with his father as chief. Mark's tunneling shield protected workers from cave-ins, but floods were still unstoppable and as a result they killed many of the workers, and even injuring Brunel, almost killing him. He spent six months recuperating, and after the work halted in the tunnel for months, Brunel did little more for the project. The tunnel was opened in 1843, and the first railway line was put in a few years after Brunel's death. They are still there today. The famous village of Clifton, now engulfed by Bristol, was home at the time to many merchant adventurers, people who made lots of money from shipping. They needed access to the other side of the huge Avon Valley, and so they put funds towards a new bridge. Many designs were put forward, but in the end only one stood out. Unsurprisingly, it was Brunel's. As a result, the Great Clifton Suspension Bridge was constructed. The bridge Brunel never saw completed. Work started on the masterpiece in 1831, but very shortly after disaster struck. The Queen Square riots drove away investors and construction halted. It would not start again until after Brunel's death. And as a result, this is probably one of the most fitting memorials to his life. Although the suspension bridge wasn't the only bridge he constructed, it isn't only bridges that Brunel is famous for. Far from it. In fact, the Great Western Railway was probably Brunel's most famous project, for it is still used today. In order to get to all my locations, it was rather ironic that I had to use his railway to get to every single one of them. However, it is a lot different to how it used to be. It had large wooden sheds for stations unlike now, but the lack of platform grandeur was made up for by the luxury and the comfort of the trip itself. Brunel was renowned for being able to draw perfect circles. However, as he travelled on the original railways, he found it impossible to. The carriages shook and vibrated the entire way. It was from this that he came up with the broad gauge. By making its track wider, the train ride was much smoother. You could put a glass of water on a table without fear of it spilling over. His old line terminated at Bristol Temple Meet. However, since the Exeter line joined up with it later on, the old station was closed and the one that people arrive at today was used instead. Not only that, but Brunel's luxurious broad gauge was replaced with the standard gauge after he died, so his great idea was simply forgotten. We're here at Box Tunnel. The Bristol Merchant Ventures wanted to fund the railway between their city and London so they could trade their goods, and they put this railway in the hands of his embarking to Brunel. Being the engineer he was, he wanted his railway to be as straight and as level as possible. In order to do this, he could go over Box Hill or around it as this would take too long. So instead, he blew a hole right through it. A hole which is 3,212 yards. And this resulted in the box tunnel right here. It took five years to complete, and rumour has it that on his birthday, the sun shines right through the tunnel. However, this has been proven to be even Brunel's great ambition was to make it possible for people to get a ticket from London which would enable them to get to America. 
Although his railway was a wonder in Victorian Britain, and probably one of the longest at its time, there was no possible way he could build a bridge across the Atlantic. And he certainly couldn't build a tunnel under it like he had under the Thames. This left him one final solution. He would have to make a ship to cross it. In 1839, this is exactly what he did. Most Atlantic crossings at Brunel's time were by sail, and due to the rough conditions and the slow crawl of these wooden hulks, they rarely ever made it. But with new steam technology available to him, Brunel intended to make the largest ever steamship at that time. There was one huge problem with his plans, however. It was an accepted theory that if a ship is too big, it wouldn't be able to carry the coal needed to power its engines. This is why steamships at the time were small things in their early days. However, Brunel knew better, and therefore his steamship, the SS Great Western, was to be over 75 metres long. It was propelled by paddle wheels. Propellers weren't used at that time. Everyone thought this would be impossible, but on its maiden voyage to New York, it broke the record for fastest crossing and took the Blue Ribbon. This feat took the world by storm, and soon Brunel needed a new steamship to keep profits coming in. What he did next was one of his greatest achievements and greatest failures. The Great Western Steamship Company was losing money fast and needed another ship. The simple and most effective solution would have been to build another Great Western, but Brunel was not one for doing the same thing twice. He intended to break the record once again, and this time he was building the biggest and first iron ship ever the SS Great Britain. The Great Ship was originally going to have paddles like the Great Western. However, at the last moment, Brunel changed his plans. He had been experimenting with a Greek invention of Archimedes, the propeller. He had even had a tug-of-war battle between a paddle ship and a propeller vessel, and the propeller won hands down. And so it was that his Great Ship had had this screw propeller. His plan worked, and the Great Britain became the fastest ship on the ocean, once again winning the Blue Ribbon. However, although at first she was a success, things quickly became disastrous. She kept sailing into huge storms, and at one point she was beached off the coast as another storm came and battered her. Although she survived, a sign of how strong Brunel's ship was, she was not worth repairing, and even though Brunel devised a successful method for getting her back in this water safely, the company didn't have enough money to keep her going. They sold her off for a measly £10,000, and soon after the Great Western Steamship Company went bankrupt. The Great Britain had a long and fascinating history afterwards, but no more was she Brunel's problem. Besides, he was already moving on to another, even bigger ship, the SS Great Eastern. She was completed in 1858, after numerous construction issues over four years, which would take a whole program to explain. There were already loads on the subject. She was launched into the Thames sideways from Scott Russell's shipyard due to her colossal size. She was 211 metres long almost three times the size of his earlier Great Western. The issue of her size puzzles many people today, for Brunel didn't design her that size for absolutely no reason. She was intended to sail to Australia without recoaling, and to carry enough coal for such a big journey she would need a lot of space. To power that space, the ship would require a big engine, and so she grew and grew. However, because Pierno took control of the route, Brunel's ship could not go where she'd been designed to go, and instead she was put on the Atlantic route, like Brunel's earlier ships before her. As a result, her enormous bulk was completely pointless and uneconomic. Because her construction was so costly, she bankrupted Scott Russell, and because of her mixed fortunes, she then bankrupted her owners. However, Brunel knew none of this, for it was before the ship's maiden voyage that something tragic occurred. Brunel had been ill for some time, and had been told to go on holiday, one of his few, to try and reduce his stress levels. However, he was also a heavy smoker. He was beginning to age, and he designed his retirement house and gardens in preparation. However, he never even got CDs completed. In 1859, he had a stroke, perhaps even on the deck of his great ship, the Great Eastern. He died 10 days later, aged 59. He was buried in the same graveyard as his father, and you can still visit it in Kensal Green Cemetery in London if you can find it. His grave is fairly insignificant and hard to spot. It may seem like an inadequate way to remember such a historic hero, but you have to remember that this is just where he is buried. His true memorials lie everywhere. They are in Portsmouth, London, Box, Bristol, 
and all over the country. Because the gauge may have changed, but the Great Western Railway, along with all his other mighty instructions, have immortalised Brunel. He had laid out the foundations and kicked off Britain's influence on the world. Britain had had the greatest railway network, the strongest navy, and still has some of the most beautiful landmarks in the world. And none of this had been possible without a man like Brunel leading the way to a better Britain. Who knows? Maybe if Brunel was alive today, he would see his ship and his bridge in Bristol and smile as he smoked on his pipe. And maybe, if he had been alive today, this would have been his Great Britain. What do you think?